Hello and welcome to Brain Injury Bites, where we provide help and advice for people after a brain injury. Hi, I'm Ashwani and I'm a trustee at Headway Warrington. I'm also a senior associate solicitor focusing on catastrophic injury, including brain injury. My name's Brooke and I've lived with a traumatic brain injury since 2007. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about dating and relationships. Um, Brooke, I'll be talking to you about your specific um, experiences around this area. And then we'll explore a little bit more the issues that can arise in terms of change of dynamics in relationships and marriages following a brain injury, as well as providing some helpful hints and tips. Of course, a lot of what we'll be discussing today will be around your specific experiences, Brooke. So we do appreciate that this is quite a wide ranging um, topic, but we hope that you'll find it useful anyway. We've previously talked about socialising as being part of the idea of love and belonging. But the other side to this is, of course, um, romantic relationships and intimacy. Brooke, why don't you tell us about some of your experiences with um, relationships and dating after you had your brain injury? When did you feel that you felt able to explore dating again? I suppose I'd been in hospital. I'd I'd been discharged from hospital. Everybody was still, like, um, coming to see me, um, seeing that, you know, I guess my parents glad to have me home. But I suppose the hysteria of that only lasted for a certain amount of time. Eventually, I was like, I was back in Scarborough. I was, um, I'd got two support workers, Laura and Tim. Tim got me something that I was into before I was going to the gym. And um, so Tim used to take me to the gym. And I noticed that I hadn't really spoken to a girl in ages um you get a lot of some one thing you get a lot of when you come out of hospital is or when you've had a big injury is you get a lot of attention you get a lot of uh, sympathy and people saying and one thing i used to hit was oh when people used to say that to me and it just makes you feel so i didn't um feel like i was like worthy anymore um i was just like somebody that somebody felt felt sorry for and so what tim did was he got me on uh, so, something called poff which is plenty of fish and um, which is i'm sure people would have heard of it it was um it was called it was like a free dating site on online i had a couple of dodgy ones in scarborough um one specific one and this this ties into uh, disinhibition i think when you when you sat opposite someone um I noticed that she had, like, you know, when you smell someone, this makes me sound really awful and I don't want to come across badly, but occasionally you notice that somebody's got, like, a bit of bad breath. Afterwards, we went and got we got an ice cream from the Harbour Bar um, and we ate our ice cream and stuff and we ended the night on a snog. Then we um, arranged to meet next time. It, it happened again, I noticed it again. And then the third time we met, I thought, I know what I'll do. And this is this makes me sound really bad, but this is what I, this is what this was my process of thinking. I thought I know what I'll do. I'll um, I'll help her out here, and I'll buy some chewing gum before we go. And um, I had this thing where I was like, I wasn't really. It's it's disinhibition. That's what it is. You don't think about what what you're doing. So I told her that she had bad breath, and um, I told her that you know it's all right. I've bought you some chewing gum. I gave her the chewing gum. And she was not, she was not best pleased. And in your head, you were thinking, well, surely she'd be thanking you. I was expecting a thank you because I thought I was doing a good thing, but <laughs> I didn't really take into consideration how she'd have been, how she'd have felt. Yeah, and no, that's uh, obviously um, classic disinhibition there. Before we move um, on, I mean, did you find that by doing it through internet dating, it was almost easier because? Because there was that sort of level of removal, you were you were able to, you know, um, interact with people. When you in text your own in, time. everybody who's done internet dating. I mean, there's a, there's a few success stories. I know I've not been to a wedding um, a couple of months ago, who they met on Tinder. But the major, the vast vast majority of people who've been involved in internet dating has had a terrible time with it. Um, I guess because it's not texting a real person you text in a profile picture until you actually meet mm. and it turns out that you meet that person and the, the photo has been covered in filters and what have you and it's just nine times out of ten you're not you're not you're not meeting the, the person that you were expecting to meet 
it's a different type of fake environment, I guess. It is, yeah, yeah. It's um, like the like the, we spoke about hospital being a fake environment. The dating world is certainly a fake environment, especially seeing as like all the manipulation that you can do with photos and stuff now. And you know, I've probably done it myself, but um, so you get these people who are like like Barbie and Ken um, meeting, and they just look absolutely nothing like that. So the um, the initial when you meet the initially the initial the initial emotion you feel is disappointment. So that's not never a good thing to start <laughs> on, is it? No, and I suppose you know much like you can curate a photograph, you can cur- curate a profile. There are pros and cons to the whole premise i guess because you've got time on the one hand to think about your responses it's not like being face to face with someone you can choose when to text choose when to send an email that's something that's caught me out massively is that well particularly why social media was so good for me because it was good because even though even though you're responding quite quickly online you still got like 10 seconds or so to think of that response and Mm. in 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 real life you don't get that yeah. And um, particularly with me, my my brain works slowly, and um, I just found that I easily get overwhelmed. Particularly if you go out into a bar or something, I found like the lights were low, so you're like straining to to see. Mm-hmm. And um, if the if there's music on, you'd have been like you know straining to to hear them above the music. Mm-hmm. And there's all these things, and what I, I sort of um, likened it to. Um, I like an everything to a mobile phone, and it's like a mobile phone. Your battery, you just your battery life just goes down, down, down. Yeah, and it's increased um, cognitive demand. Yeah, there's lots of things going on. All these different things are, are draining your battery. Yeah, so um, that also affects your ability to to have a, a fluid conversation and mm. um, appear okay. So <clears throat> you. You were in Scarborough. You then um, moved back to Manchester. Yeah, um, it was always it was always my um, ambition to move back to Manchester. Probably because I, I was a, so. This is where I'm different. You know, like every every brain injury is different, isn't it? You've got you've got um, there's that saying that once you've seen if you've seen one brain injury, you've seen one brain injury. And this is mine, my story. Like I wasn't um, in a relationship. I wasn't, you know. I wasn't full time employed. I was um, I was a student. I was you know part worked part time at a bar. Um, I loved my life at the time. Ever since then, I've been trying to get back to that person I was then, which mm. was a a twenty four year old lad who was a student, which is not you know that's that's not um, a popular position to be in. And I um, so were you trying to? almost pick up where you left off yeah i was you you know you you look back and you remember those good times but you know again like the fake environment you know student life is not a real environment is it you don't Mm -hmm. you don't have a normal life and i suppose i was i was trying to all this time i've been trying to get back to that 24 year old student and i suppose that's why i've had difficulty in fitting back in because i was trying to get back to being that 24 year old student who went out and socialized all the time and that's what I saw as my goal to get back to. But of course, during the time, everyone else has been, everyone else has been, you know, finishing the degree, getting the job, carrying on with the career. And um, I found that I've, I've just very, got very little in common with people. Mm. So you moved back to Manchester and amongst the various things that you got yourself into, um, one of them was speed dating. The speed dating thing, I've actually done that a few times. It's, it's, it's actually quite good, and I would recommend it to anyone. Um, even if you're in a couple, go together. It's, uh, <laughs> I think the thing was for me, you get like, like mini dates, um, like three minutes. So I thought, about, you know, in my head I'd rehearsed this, what I was going to do on this, this mini date, and I just exhausted myself putting all my effort into that. And then I remember looking up after the first one or two, so I had another eight people to meet. And I just remember just being just absolutely exhausted. And um and I just the last eight was just honestly just trying to trying to get through it. Mm. I guess it can be very difficult because with brain injury recovery, a lot of it is about pacing yourself. And we've certainly discussed that when talking about fatigue, the need to pace yourself to take things 
slowly give yourself time. But speed dating, of course, is very much the opposite. You've, yeah. It's very quick. You've got to have that um, persona that you want to put across in two minutes repeatedly. Yeah. I, and you try not to say the same things and like, you can hear <laughs> you sat near somebody they've had like a previous date with before um, and you try not to let them hear them you saying the same things that you said to them to the other person but it's a what it was was it was like a massive um cognitive drain mm. and it was just um it just it, i just it just exhausted me and um i learned the chart i learned the importance of of pacing myself there and um something else that came into play there was my memory problems mm. a lot of about a lot of brain injury for me has been been about trying to fit in again mm. and you try to although people say you should be proud of your brain injury and what have you you try you, it's not something um i wanted to I, i've always wanted to make it look as if i, I didn't have a brain injury um one of the first dates I went on was to the cinema in Powerswood in, in Didsbury, where, where I live. I remember I was sat in the cinema and I went to the toilet and then I came back into the cinema and I was like, oh my God, where am I sat? You're then trying to look around in this dark room, <laughs> trying not to look like you've, you've actually lost yourself, but trying to, um, trying to casually find your seat. I remember like I got into so much such a panic. I mean, it was dark. Everyone was watching the film and you don't want to pace up and down. I remember thinking about um, just sitting at the front, <laughs> the front and just watching the rest of the film by myself. But, you know, I, I had this date to get back to. Anyway, luckily I found her. But that's something that, something that I've taken on now. I always, whenever I'm somewhere and I leave my seat, I always think remember where i'm sat it happened to me in a it's happened to me a few in a number of times it happened to me in restaurants i'd go to the toilet and then you come back out especially if it's a big restaurant and you just think oh my god where am i sat i mean it was it was good it's where mobile phones could come and i was with my family at the time and i just rung my mum to come get me and um you know this it, it, you do need to take a mental note of where you sat particularly in car parks, if you drive, mm -hmm. um, the traffic centre is an absolute nightmare. Um, I've spoken about when I got lost outside John Lewis. It, this thing happened to me. I went to, um, I went, I was with somebody that I'd only met a couple of times um, on a train, like a couple of weeks ago, and we we're going over to Liverpool. And um, I went to the toilet. I came back out, and then you, you realise on your way back that you haven't remembered where you sat, mm -hmm. and. Um, I'm looking about and I can't see where I'm sat and I'm, I, went, I went, I was walking along and then I got to the back, to the end of the carriage and I thought, oh no, um, did I actually turn the right way out of the toilet? And then just at that moment, he shouted me, but um, it's just, just the embarrassment factor. And I'm not saying I'm not proud of having a brain injury. I wouldn't say that at all, but I will, it's not something... Um, you don't I want to draw attention no, to it. No, you don't want to draw some attention to it. No, yeah. and I don't and, think... Uh, and I guess that's personal to you. But, you know, people will approach that differently and some people yeah. will be happy to be, you know, heart on sleeve, cards on the table, this is what it is. Other people might want to keep that back. Everybody's different and there's no right or wrong way. That's where the um, that headway brain injury card can come in useful as well. Because mm, if I want yeah. to go to the... I remember when I first got discharged from hospital, I got a disability rail card. I was I was on the train and there was the guard had come along, charged me fifty quid for a for a full price ticket. Yeah. Because I was my I think my rail card was out of date by about a couple of weeks. And my dad went <laughs> because and I was like I remember because I was like, um I still had this big scar there and I told this guard, I was like proper like <laughs> couldn't you know just, i'm sorry i'm sorry I'm just really really sorry and um i was so um shaken up and it was like one of my first outings and i'd got um and he charged me like another 50 quid mm. because i think it was out of date and um he's like i remember the guard saying yeah i was saying i've just been in hospital i've just been in the coma and he says yeah i can i can see you've had um an injury there and um i remember my dad going mental and that was that was that was like could have been that could have been that could have finished someone off that could have knocked someone's confidence um but i suppose me being disinhibition i didn't really give a 
But, um, <laughs> that's the only reason I got through it. But from what you've told me about um, some of your experiences with the dating, I guess there's a lot more that goes in. Dating in itself is terrifying. It's um, you know it's putting yourself out there, laying yourself open for other people to see um, whether or not you know you, you are attractive to them. It's 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 terrifying, but I guess when you mix a brain injury into it, it's also all the additional strategies that you've discussed, taking a note of where you've sat, um, whereabouts in the restaurant, the cinema you might be, so that you're not leaving your date hanging because you've gone to the toilet and you can't remember where you are. And then them wondering, have you done a runner? Yeah. Um, And, you know, the memory issues as well in terms of what have I told this person, trying to maintain that trying to think about, you know, it, it's, I guess a lot of it is also having that insight um, where you might have certain, um, I don't really like the word deficits, but perhaps that is, um, or just issues, you know, where, where you might need some additional support. Do you know what it's ta- always taught me? That something I've picked up on, which is a good thing, is it's t- that I always tell the truth. Hmm. I don't know if it's a Mark Twain quote, that if you don't, if you always tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you've got enough going on in your head as it is yeah. about trying to remember a story. Mm. Um, the other thing that I was thinking about, and again, this comes back to the context of love and belonging. And we've touched on this already that, you know, you, when you moved to Manchester, you were meeting people and at a different stage, I guess, to them. Y- you have also... I think there was a, another example where you felt that gulf in a way um, when you you went on a date with someone who worked at a prison. One of the things uh, dating did for me was to, it really highlighted how different I was from everyone else in my sort of peer group. I went to meet this girl who was, she was, she was a year older than me, but she was just so much older than me in herself. She worked at, she worked at Strange Ways Prison. In Manchester, I can't remember what role she did. She wasn't a prison guard, but she was. Uh, she was something. But I remember her being just so much. She felt so much older than me. I felt like such a like. I felt quite like a pathetic child in her in her presence. I realised that she, on a daily basis, she was dealing with some of the most dangerous prisoners in the UK, and. And I realised that on a daily basis, I was having to go to bed like up to three times a day because I couldn't even stay awake for the whole day. Um, I was occasionally going to um, basic charity and I was just doing my few hours rehab, which which in itself exhausted me. Mm -hmm. And I just remember feeling, um, I guess that's the self-worth thing, isn't it? I just remember feeling so quite pathetic. Did you you tell her you had a brain injury? I think I did, you know. I went through this, this period of, I would tell everyone like what had happened to me and because I, I had this thing I didn't, because I did so little in my life or on a day-to-day basis, for instance, in, in comparison to somebody that was dealing with the UK's worst prisoners, I would tell them this story um, and I would tell them this mad story how I'd been walking home uh, down Portland Street in Manchester and I got hit by a car at 50 mile an hour, I'd been in a coma and it was just, I did it really to... Because I didn't want to, I didn't ever want to sound un- uninteresting, and this was something that always got people's attention. Mm. But it was, in hindsight, it was probably, it was probably too early to say that. I'm missing, why? Why do you think it was too early? I'm not saying don't, don't tell them you've got a brain injury, but I think it, it, to be the first thing that you, that you say to people, I think it kind of, it kind of shocked people. That, going to that first impressions thing, isn't it? Like um, it just shocks people. I suppose awareness around brain injury is incre- has increased and it's increasing all the time. But mm. particularly then, back in 2013, 14, they heard the word brain and people would generally run a mile. And um, I think what looking back, what I was doing wrong was I was being I was being overly confident, but it was fake confidence. So mm. I was like trying to get this story out, and that was the first thing I told them to try and sound interesting, but. I just must have sounded a bit crazy. Maybe um, not crazy, but not crazy, perhaps but a bit full on. Yeah, full on's a good way. 
yeah, yeah. and I, I think I've been sent people the other way yeah. and I didn't um you know, there's quite a few things, I, there are quite a few, a few instances I didn't get a second date. And do you know what? I didn't even necessarily fancy that person, but it was um, because they didn't want a second date with me. I was like, why not? What's wrong mm. with me? Kind of thing. And, yeah. um, and then, you know, if I did fancy them, it was just like, it was really, I always used to take it to heart. And I was yeah. always wondering what was the what was the right way to go about it and to be honest i probably still haven't worked it out but if anyone's you know wanting to do this themselves i guess it's everyone's everyone's individual aren't they but the approach i've gone for or i go for now is try and get them to get to know me a little bit before mm. i tell them that i think yeah. you do have to you definitely have to tell people but and do you perhaps now try to learn more about them as well before introducing that conversation in about yourself yeah um something i watched it was a it was a brain injury rehabilitation program and in the brain injury rehabilitation what people tend to do is they tend to talk about themselves a lot yeah and this brain injury rehabilitation what they did they had like um they had like it was a ball and they're holding the ball and when you've got the ball you talk about yourself then you've got to pass it to someone else so it was trying to you know so i encourage you to listen to other people mm. and learning uh, listening is, is is such a big thing yeah i suppose listen i mean listening is a big thing and definitely even absent a brain injury it's important in 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 a dating scenario but then you've also got the added um factor of remembering what's being been said yeah and being able to bring that back into conversation yeah that's a, a concentration thing you've got to if somebody yeah you don't just ask people a question you've got to make a, an effort to listen to people as well mm -hmm. um, rather than just asking them and then just switching off while they speak and then waiting for your turn to speak mm. um it's again cognitively demanding it's, yeah cognitively demanding that's what it is and so now perhaps your strategy is to leave the conversation about brain injury until a little bit later on. Um, how how do people react? Do, have you had instances where people have wanted to know more, where they've perhaps then gone and learnt about it independently? That comes back to everybody being individual, isn't it? Some people have been great about it, some people have been not. Um, so there's times when I've wanted to wanted to go on a date with this person and people have, people have advised me that you have to be honest with them you, mm. you know and if and if they don't like it then then it's their problem and you don't want to be with them in the first place but what i find is that's not really giving people a chance there's a way to go about things because i just find that if you if you um tell them in the right context and the right you tell them in the right way then you know they might well be open to it no well, it, of course it can be um full-on and Again, that's, I guess, part of the um, game of dating is, you know, whatever it is, is when, when you introduce certain topics, big topics, whatever there's no, they be. There's no one size fits all for it, is there? No. So everybody's different. So. And yeah, unfortunately for some people, the label of brain injury might not be something that they're willing to learn more about or take the time to to get to know you with but um that's unfortunately that well that's that's yeah, dating as well isn't it, it is, to yeah. a large degree and that i suppose brings me on to the next um topic in this um because up until now we've talked about your specific experiences around dating mm -hmm. um but as we said at the beginning that that's personal to you um I'm also mindful that a number of our listeners um, will be in more established relationships, marriages potentially, and or they might, be, yeah, they might be supporting somebody, um, a spouse, um, partner who's had a brain injury. They themselves might have a brain injury, or um, and and their spouse is supporting them. There's so many statistics out there. Depending on where you go, those statistics ch um, differ, but I think there's a common perception anyway that. Um, after a brain injury, there's um, there's a high chance of um, a relationship breaking down um, because the person that um, was before the injury is not the same person after the injury. And we've talked about that quite a lot in previous episodes. And so it's also thinking about support for um those relationships and and what can be done and i know certainly i've um i i've 
put this in place with people I've supported in terms of additional counselling um, to, to mourn that, to mourn the loss of the person that was and to try and find a way through for the relationship to, to support the, the brain injured person, but also for, for the non-brain injured party of, of a relationship to to have an outlet to to be able to um, to talk, to grieve, um, and to understand, because at the end of the day, a relationship it's it's two halves of a whole, and where where something significant like this comes into play, it, it upsets that balance, and it's about being able to be strong and resilient in order to um, to be able to regain some sense of balance and and move forwards, and for some people. That can be done. I have seen it done well, um, but in other cases, unfortunately, um, it can come to an end. Thinking about help and advice then for our listeners, I guess, again, we can sort of almost split this into two. So from a dating perspective, we've talked about the extra strategies that might be involved in terms of preparing yourself for for dating and utilising strategies around memory, around fatigue, which can be really important in order to try and try and feel confident around it because it's it's difficult enough you know without a brain injury honesty the i thought that was a really good tip brooke um being open and honest of course it means that you're not having to remember some fan- fantastical story that you've made up and it's showing the true self but obviously as you say you know it's different for every situation and every individual as to when you might want to open up about what's happened um, about your injury and how it affects you. I think that's one thing I've lost is the ability to be spontaneous Mm. and um, everything is better if if I'm prepared for it. Yeah. A lot of it is also shoring up the resources around you, friends, family, people that you trust, because as I said, dating is quite difficult. It can be terrifying and it can knock your confidence if, you know, if you go on a date and then the other person's not interested for whatever reason, which might be completely unconnected to your brain injury. But it, it's difficult enough adding the brain injury. And we know that a, a number of people can can be prone to more depression as well. So it's important to really prepare and be prepared that not every date is going to be successful, that you're not necessarily going to find the love of your life, um, you know, on, on that date. Um, it, it's it's very difficult, isn't it? One thing I was told that when sort of I initially wanted to start looking for a partner, I was told that, oh, you, you know, they could meet you anyway. It could, it'll, it'll happen. And it, that's one thing. It doesn't, nothing just happens. You mm. have to or put yourself in situations where it's more likely to happen. Mm. Like if you join a club, it's much more likely to happen that the club where you're meeting like, you know, 20 people than it would be if you're sitting at home doing nothing waiting yeah. for it to happen. Of course, absolutely. Putting yourself out there, but with shoring up your resources and and giving yourself the best possible um, opportunity. And then for our listeners who are in relationships, thinking about brain injury specific marriage counselling and brain injury education. And I really can't stress enough the importance of brain injury education because that injury has such a a wide impact on so many areas of life. And it's important to understand that the way someone acts, the way they behave isn't their fault it's it's as a result of something that they cannot control because of a process in their brain so it's being able to understand how their brain might work now and understand what sort of strategies need to be used so that you can have a meaningful relationship um but i I do also strongly advocate for counseling for the non-brain injured individual and i've seen this time and again with people that i support that the focus is on the brain injured individual and you yourself have said this brooke you know when when you were out of hospital and or when you were in hospital and then when you're out of it everyone was positive it was all about you it was that fake environment but the other spouse partner can get left behind and that can that can definitely have an impact on their own 
sense self-identity and sense of worth because they may feel that suddenly all they are now is a carer and a supporter um, and they've lost that sense of themselves they've lost the person that they fell in love with um, and so that counseling for them to to have an outlet for their grief um, for their own personal for, for them to work things out on their own and above all remember that good relationships don't just happen they take work from both sides thanks for listening make sure you check the footnotes for more help advice and resources please don't forget to follow subscribe and share our content if you do have any suggestions for topics that you'd like us to cover why not drop us a line at hi at braininjurybites.co.uk